in talking about the fear of the Lord, the mistaken idea can be oftentimes that that means that you're afraid. Afraid and fear are two different things. It's right to be afraid of certain things. You should be afraid of a tiger. You should be afraid of a lion. Now, I remember when we were in South Africa, and even though there was double fences between us, a lion had slipped up through the grass. I never saw him. I was enamored with him. They were up there scratching on the tops of the trees. And when that lion roared, I jumped back and screamed like a little girl, fell on my hind end. And of course, everybody got a good laugh out of it. And I did too after I quit shaking. You say, why? I'm afraid of lions. And I thought the lion had gotten out of the cage and was fixing to have me for uh, breakfast after I had seen those. I had it in my mind and they were up there stretched out and I thought they'd be stretched over me. While we were there, there was a Japanese fellow that got out of his car, even though he had been warned repeatedly, don't get out of your car. And a lion came up and grabbed, we didn't see it, we read about it in the paper. A lion came up and grabbed him by the head and drug him out into the bushes. And then they yelled at the guy who was the guide, and they said, well, why didn't you go in there and get him? <laughs> he said, for what? <laughs> what are you going to do if a lion already has somebody in their head? They've already crushed them. And so uh, it's right to be afraid of certain things. It's not right to fear God when you're doing what's... Uh, it's not right to fear man when you're doing what God would have you to do. What I've tried to impress you with over the past several months has been this, or past several weeks has been this. The fear of God is the key ingredient to your understanding things about God. You can never fear God too much. Uh, you, the fearing God is the thought or the idea in your mind that God permeates everything you do. Every thought, every action, every deed, every consequence, you consider God before you move. That's Him making you quick, as we talked about the other night, not to be redundant. Now, when you don't fear God, you begin to fear something else. Sometimes you fear losing your reputation. Sometimes you fear man in the sense of what a man can do to you and those kinds of things. And I want to just cover a few of those things. Now, if God is your master, does that mean you should be afraid? Does that mean you should fear? Look at what Malachi says. It does mean you should be afraid. It means that if you're sinning, it means that you're not afraid. You're not, you don't fear God. You don't fear the consequences of God. He says, well, I, just, I don't believe that. Well, you can water it down any way you want to water it down. But the bottom line is, is when we sin, it's because we don't think God is going to do what He should justifiably do. The Bible said, Whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. Is that right? Okay, shouldn't we be afraid of that? I don't want to get a whipping if I don't need to get it. I don't want to have a whipping if I don't need to have it. If I can avoid a whipping, wouldn't you want to avoid a whipping? especially from God, you know what he says? If that's what you choose to do, if that's what you're going to wind up doing, I should be concerned about the consequences. I'm not like, uh, uh, I don't know that I can me measure up to my namesake, David. David comes along there and when uh, Nathan comes in there and says, Thou art the man, David said, You're right. And David takes the consequences. David, a little bit later on, numbers Israel. And he says, uh, you've got three choices there. And David said, put me in the hands of the living God because he knows how much I can take and, and I'll let him decide what punishment is best for me. I don't know that I can hold up to that. I may have a tendency to be more like Saul. Saul winds up doing some things in 1 Samuel chapter number 15. He has no fear of God whatsoever. And then he gets in there and tries to talk himself out of that. Tries to work out a plea deal. That's where you get plea bargaining now. He's plea bargaining. During that whole time, he never does come to grips with the fact you've sinned against God. You haven't just sinned against the people and sinned against the priesthood and sinned against... He didn't come to that, in any of that whatsoever. What he comes up with is, is that, well, the people said, well, the people said the fear of the people and what the people are going to say oftentimes will drive your emotions and make you do things that are contrary to what God wants you to do. And I'll show you that in a little while here. Now, all of us are prone to that. None of us. Not a single person here is not prone to human nature. Human nature is self-protecting. It's self-preservation. It wants to take care of the flesh. If you don't divide the flesh from the Spirit, you're going to have difficulty in this thing called the Christian life for all your Christian life. 
Your Christian life is going to be a struggle. It's a war, the Bible says in Galatians 5. The flesh lust against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. So you cannot do the thing that you would. What keeps you from doing what God wants you to do? I'll tell you, 90% of the time, it's you. <laughs> I mean, every now and then you might be able to blame it on somebody else, but the majority of the time, you and I are our own worst enemy. I'm not advocating myself from that responsibility. I'm just as guilty as you are. When I sin, it's because I made a choice to. Now, I'm different maybe than you are. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit tells me before I do it. I don't believe I trip into it. Yep. I don't think I fall into it. I don't think I walk along and, well, I just fell into sin. I don't believe that. The Lord says, big hole right there, boy, you better watch it. He calls me boy. He says, boy, you better watch that. You better watch it. And I said, well, I think I can jump the hole. You know, I think I'll get around it. I get too close to the edge. I find myself in the hole. It's not because he didn't warn me. It's because I made a choice to go ahead and go through the hole as opposed to go around the hole because I think I can handle it. Now, maybe you're not that way. Maybe your attitude is, oh, I can take care of that. It won't affect me at all. The problem is, is that if He is your master, it's evident in your every decision that you make. Every decision you make. That's the fear of God. The fear of God means, gentlemen, that when the Lord tells you something on uh, Mother's Day or the rest of the 364 days of the year to do something for your wife and kids, if you fear God, you get up and do what God tells you to do. You don't follow what you want to do. Amen. You have to go by what the Bible says. Whether you like what the Bible says or not, you say, what is that? If He's your master. Well, is He your master? Well, if He's your master, look at this passage here in Malachi. And don't worry, I'm not going to Malachi 3.10. Don't panic. The Bible said, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. Okay? So you give an honor to whom honors do. Is that right? I'm in Malachi chapter number 1. I said, I'm not going to 3. Y'all turn there anyway. You've been conditioned. You're like Pavlov's dog. Some of you have to study to figure out whose dog that is. Who's Pavlov? The son of honor to his father, the servant is master. If I then be a father, where's my honor? You know how you honor him? You let him have your way, have his way. He doesn't let you have your way. It's if I'm your father, then you give me honor. By what? Give me your what? Give me my way. Let me do with you what I know is best for you. That's hard. That's subjection. Look at the next thing. If I'm your master, doesn't say where's your honor. Look what is replaced with. Where's my what? That means if I'm your master, why aren't you still in fear of me? In Genesis chapter number 22, you'll start reading down through there, and that's a great account about Isaac and those kind of things. And when he gets done with it, come over to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. When he gets down to the end of that after he's offered up Isaac there and he gets ready to put a torch to him and this and that and the other, uh, it, it's a, one of the strangest things in the passage is that he finds the ram over there with his horns hung up in the bushes. He'd have to have his horns hung in the bushes because the rest of it, if it was his skin or his, or his wool, he would have uh, been blemished. But at any rate, and the horns uh, wearing the thorn of crown, the crown of thorns. But at any rate, he goes over there, and then uh, the Lord speaks to him, and he gets ready to plunge the knife into his son. Do you know what he says to him? Now I know that thou not lovest, fearest. It's taught as love. You say why? It's like I told you nowadays. The psychological slop you're being taught out of the pulpits nowadays. There's so much sugar in the pulpit nowadays. You get diabetes. Listen to people. You say why? They don't speak like God speaks. I'd much rather get a complaint about a preacher being too mean than one that's uh, trying to trip this uh, line and justify all of his behavior or her behavior, their behavior of doing what they want to do and make God say something he didn't say. You know what he said? Now I know you fear me. What does that mean? You put me ahead of your family. You put me ahead of everything. Now I know you fear me. Not love me. But that psychological slut, that fear is too strong a word. Don't use that word, fear. That's not, that's not how God really meant to say that. He meant to say, you know, now I know you love me and now you care about me and all that. No, now you know, I'm worried about the consequences with God if I don't do. Now, would you, would you imagine this? Would you agree with me when I tell you this? That would have been a pretty serious decision. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, to a land I'll tell thee, offer him there for a burnt offering, a sacrifice, a burnt offering. 
Wouldn't you agree that'd be a pretty tough thing? You know what motivated him? He feared God. The consequences of displeasing God was greater than whatever consequences he might face for killing his own kid. Now, I realize that's a hard thing to get your head around, but the Lord puts that in the, in the Bible for a reason and tells you, you should fear God above all things. Well, do you? If he's your master, then why don't you fear him? If he's your master... Would you agree with me then, if I'm making an argument, would you agree with me, then the opposite of that would be that the reason I do what I want to do when I want to do it, the way I want to do it, is because I don't fear Him. Is that a fair argument? He said, if, if I'm your master, well, if He is your master, then why do you do what you do? You say, well, preacher, it's just sin. Listen, there's all kinds of ways to water it down, folks. But the bottom line is a lack of fear. And I think it's a lack because preachers don't preach it anymore because it's an unpopular subject. They don't want a God that's up there that's ready to knock you and knock the tar out of you because he's just old uh, Father Time sitting up there with a big old long beard and he's just up there to do your bidding and do whatever you want and never hurt you and never cause any problems for you and he only wants the best for you and all that. Listen, there's nothing in that Bible ever uh, that, uh, that God does that's wrong. God never does wrong. You So I could tell you a few times he did wrong. See? You ever ask God why He did something and be mad about God as if your way of doing it would be better? Well, if you feared God, you know what you'd say? Well, He knows how it works out better. He's got an element. Some of you are shaking your head. Well, I, you know, I don't know about that. You know, you, you can't help it. You already shook it. I already saw it. <laughs> and now it's like, oh no, I was just getting the flies off of me, you know, that kind of thing. No, fear in God is not something that's talked about much anymore. You say, why? There was a day and time where this nation thundered in the pulpits about fear in God. Not anymore. You're more afraid of a nuclear attack than you are about eternal things. You're more worried about things that are going to happen to the economy and what's going to happen to your creature comforts than you are about pleasing God. You wouldn't be laying on your fat uh, 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 posterior at the house right now if you feared God. You're more worried about what's going to happen to your income. You'll get up tomorrow and go to work. Don't tell me you're not worried about your finances and about losing your status in life. And don't tell me you're not worried about what's going to happen with your kids. You'll have them in class tomorrow. But you won't have them in Sunday school today. Well, if God's your master... Not the truth, whether you, I, you know, well, I, you know, but preacher, I just, I, I know, I know. Water it down any way you want to. But if God's your master, then it comes to pleasing Him first. Let me show you a couple of things that fear can do to you. Look in 2 Timothy. Everybody knows this passage here. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. If you allow fear to remain in you and what you're always thinking, it can get ingrained in you. I mentioned to you on uh, Wednesday night, I, I told you that if you tell a lie long enough, sooner or later that lie will become truth to somebody. And their perception winds up being the whole gamut of everything. You just keep telling them that and telling them that and telling them that. After a while, you know what happens? They lose their balance and then before long it becomes their truth. And it's truth to them. And the next thing you know, they got to rewrite the Bible. Look in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, look in verse 7. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You say, what happens if you allow fear to remain over the things you shouldn't fear, which I'll list them here for you in just a little while. You know what will happen? Those things will become a part of you. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. They wind up controlling your thoughts. You're controlled by your thoughts. I have a list of a whole bunch of phobias and stuff like that. Suffice it to say, that's because you dwell on it all the time. And you dwell on it, you dwell on it, you dwell on it, you think it's going to happen, you think it's going to happen, you think it's going to happen. It doesn't matter if it's going to happen or not. Every time all of a sudden the sky turns black, you think you're going to get sucked up in a tornado or get blown away by a hurricane because you've made up your mind that's how you're going to wind up dying. You wind up sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the first time you catch a little bit of a cold. Well, you know you're going to die and you're going to get cancer, so you must be going to have cancer and you must be going to die. And you just dwell on that all the time. And so all of a sudden, you get all these phobias that come back. You become what's called a hypochondriac. The first time something happens to you, you think you're dying. 
And if you get uh, Manchowson disease, then that's something where you always get pleasure out of thinking everybody else is sick, and then you wind up wanting to be the one to treat them all the time and try to fix them up, and you take great pleasure sometimes in even making people around you sick just so that you can come around and cure them. Study it. Ask some of these doctors and nurses that are in here if what I'm telling you is not true. You say, what? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Those fears drive you. The fear of not being liked. The fear of losing a reputation. The fear of whether or not you're going to make the team or not, or make the grade or not. And, and you start wringing your hands as if your reputation is all dependent upon how you appear to everyone else. Well, I wish you'd be that concerned about how you appear to God. You ever pause to think? Are you as worried about how you appear to Him as you appear to other people? Just because other people approve to you, you think other people are going to be the one standing at the gate to heaven? You think when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, after everything's over and done with, and you're standing up there all alone, are you going to be like Esau? You say, what happened to Esau? Esau wasn't afraid of God. Esau could care less about God. That Bible says in the book of Hebrews, as a matter of fact, he mentions it four times. You know what he says about Esau? He said about Esau, he said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. You'll find that in Malachi. You'll find that a couple times in Hebrews. You'll find that over there in the book of Genesis. You know the saddest thing about that story? You get to looking at that story about Esau. That Bible said that he sought carefully, uh, that he sought uh, 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 forgiveness with tears and could find no place. Though he sought it carefully with tears, it says. You say, why? You know the most uh, the, the, the delusion that boy lived under for a long time? He thought everything was fine. God never showed him until he died that God hadn't been using him at all. You say, why? He despised putting God first. He comes down there and the boy says to him, he says, uh, you're hungry, aren't you? He said, I'm starving to death, man. I think I'm going to fall over and faint. And he said, well, you think you're going to faint? He said, yeah. So I got some pottage here, some, some uh, chili, whatever you want to call it there, some red pottage. And he said, I can give you some of that. And he said, okay, give me some. And he said, well, what do you give me for it? You know what he, the first thing that came to his mind? The thing that meant the, less to, the least to him. He said, here's my birthright. My birthright? Yeah, your birthright. For what? A bowl of pottage? What is that? Uh, birth, birthright means he would have been in the lineage of Christ. It wouldn't have been Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. You know what else? He gave up the right to be the prophet, the preacher, the one that was chosen. You know what he said? Who cares about all that kind of stuff? Doesn't do me any good. I'm hungry right now. What does it take to fill your tummy up? 20 minutes? 30 minutes? How long? I mean, it doesn't take long before all of a sudden that hunger button's been turned off. Is that right? You know what he said? I don't care. It make no difference to me. I don't care a thing at all. A little bit later on, Jake comes back over there after making a mess of his life. He's been over there for 20 years or so. He comes back. He's fixing to make Esau. He's got his women out there in front and children out in front. He's got gifts and stuff ready. And he finally runs into his brother out there, Esau. And he says to his brother, he said, Hey, I brought you these gifts. You know what Esau said? Esau said, I don't need nothing, man. I mean, the Lord's been good to me. I got plenty. I got riches. I got wealth. I mean, I'm prosperous. You know what? He doesn't know until he dies that God hadn't been using him at all. He hadn't even been paying attention to him. God said, I hated you. It's in your Bible. Change it in all the other ones. It's in your Bible. God hated him. You say, why? Because he despised putting God first. You see how that's adverse to your flesh? You see how contrary that is to preaching nowadays? Nowadays, if you preach anything except you're first, you're the most important, you're special, you're all special, everybody's special, you all get a trophy today, everybody gets a win today. Or preacher, what about the ones that aren't mothers today? Get married and have a kid. And if not, then thank God you didn't have a kid. Hey, can you be content? I mean, maybe the Lord don't want you to have a kid. Maybe you'd be a great mom. Maybe you'd be a better mom to somebody that doesn't have, that already has a kid and doesn't take care of kids. But it's funny about that contentment thing. But you know what he says about that boy? He said, Esau have I hated. But he never tells Esau until he's dead. I don't want to get up there to heaven and the Lord say, Hey, how are you doing? Saved by the blood, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Who are you? You may be one of my sheep, but uh, you sure hadn't been doing anything for me. You sold out, didn't you, boy? 
You say it never happened. Why do you think Esau's in the Bible? Tell me it doesn't happen. It happens to believers. It happens when you put anything ahead of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Right? Isn't that, a, isn't that one of the first things that he writes in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So a preacher, I don't really worship them. Really? Worship is simply putting them ahead of your God. Well, I never do that. Well, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're ready for the rapture right now. You're ready to hit the coffin right now. Then that's good. Good for you. For the rest of us mortals, that's a struggle every day. That's Galatians 5 every day. Every day. That, that pride, that arrogance, that I want it my way. You know what can happen? You can dwell on that stuff so much and worry about that stuff so much, it'll change your personality. Literally, it'll change who you are. Look, if you will, please, with me over to Galatians 5. I'll amen it if you don't. I know good preaching when I hear it. For some of you, it controls every thought you have. There used to be a thing called, uh, uh, what was the thing? You put your hand in a, a box. It was a show, Fear, Fear Something. Fear, fear factor, that's it. And, and they had all kind of things, all kind of phobias people have of heights and of water and, you know, and that kind of a deal. I've never seen anybody have fear of air, but at any rate, that'd be a hard thing to fear. But they had all kind of stuff doing it. You don't overcome fear that way by just doing it. And it just, there's some things that you should have an affinity toward that you should be like, I don't want any part to do with that. I don't like snakes. I believe every snake should be greeted with a 12 gauge. Now, you know, if you like to handle them, that's, that's your business. They've got a place for you in the Pentecostal church. I don't want nothing to do with snakes. Big ones, little ones, live ones, and dead ones. I'm glad I'm not living during the days of the apostle. If you handle any dead, or, you know, handle those snakes and that kind of a deal, and if it bites you and all that, I'm not interested in doing that. I wouldn't want to be Paul. I'd have shook him off in the fire and probably jumped in there with him too. I don't, I don't, I don't like snakes. But I don't, I don't have to try to overcome my fear of snakes by playing with snakes. I have a healthy fear of snakes. Well, what do you think it is? You think it's a garter snake? I think it's a living snake, and if it stays around here, it's going to be a dead snake. Amen. Well, but it might have been a good snake. I killed a big one one day, I don't know, three or four foot long, and that kind of a deal, and I sent a picture of him to Monroe, and Monroe said, what'd you kill him for, man? That's a good snake. It is now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> only good snake to me is a dead snake. I mean, I'm one of those, you see them crossing the road back in the days when I used to hunt a million years ago. You see one crossing the road, I try to time it where I get the tires and I lock the brake up and skid on him like that. I do it intentionally. I don't run over him. I run over him for him and see him crawl off. Mm -mm, you're going to be a greasy spot there. You say, why? I don't like snakes. Now, why is that? Preacher, you shouldn't be afraid of them. I have enough sense to be afraid of them. Now, if one of them comes in the house, I'm not going to go scream and stand up on the sofa and that kind of a deal, but I'm going to have a hole in my floor somebody's going to have to fix. <laughs> so what you need to do is get you a pistol and get you some rat shot and all that stuff. I have a 12-gauge. It's okay to say that. I have a 12-gauge. It's legal. <laughs> I, I'm just telling you, I can guarantee you I can hit him from a long ways off with a 12-gauge. One of them pellets is going to hit him. What are you going to do about the hole in the wall? I can fix the hole in the wall, but me going to sleep knowing there's a snake in my house... So, oh, preacher, they won't bother you. Uh huh. I'll be the one to crawl up underneath the, 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 the sheets or whatever, and the next thing you know, it's sitting right up here looking at me in, in the morning, that kind of a thing. Uh uh. As long as he's there, I'm going to take care of him. All right, so look in Galatians chapter number five. Uh, in Galatians chapter number five, you know what will happen? If you're not careful, it'll put you in bondage. If you surrender to that fear, you know what will happen? That stronghold of fear, if you're set free, you can't do anything. You can't enjoy anything. Look in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I'm not worried. Uh, you heard a couple of weeks ago, one of the preachers said to you uh, that you don't have to worry about uh, uh, fear anymore. You are uh, Abba Father. It's in Romans uh, 8 there. That bondage to fear, I don't worry about losing my salvation. I don't worry about... Excuse, why? I believe what the Bible says. Not by how I live. If I looked at how I live, I can't line up with the Bible. I'd be lost every day. 
I'd probably be lost ten times a day. But you know what I do? What I do know? I know that that can put bondage on you. I know that I can get so locked down that I can't enjoy the things that God did give me. The liberty that you have there is the liberty with inside the confines of I'm in the law of Christ. I can do what God wants me to do when He wants me to do it. God's pleased with me. Okay, good. I can enjoy that. But some of you get so worried about everything you can't even breathe. Come to Isaiah chapter number 10. Bondage always makes you bitter. That's why charismatics don't like it. But they're in the wrong kind of bondage. They're in bondage to anything and everything goes. Anything and everything doesn't go. I enjoy knowing where the boundaries are. I do. I like that. It gives me great liberty. I, I don't, it, doesn't, it, it takes the decision-making process out for me. I appreciate it. I, now look, this is just me. I'm positive it's not you, so I'm not trying to put me on you. But I, when I drive down a road and all of a sudden the last speed limit sign I saw was, you know, 70, and then all of a sudden there's a stretch and I haven't seen one, I get, I get a little nervous. You say, why? I'm looking for that guy sitting on the side of the road with a stick and a box and he's getting ready to drop it down on me, a, a trap. <laughs> no, I, I need to know, is it still 70? Now, you probably don't do that. You say, well, the last thing I saw was 70, it'd be just fine. I immediately back off. You say, why? Well, how do I know it's still 70? It's been a while since I saw one. Well, somebody cut it down. Well, you can take it to court. I don't want to go to court. How do I provide? How do I prevent that? I just knock down about five miles an hour. And the guy wants to pull me over. He's kind of like, I'm pulling you over. Why are you pulling me over? There ain't nobody here that don't speed. What's wrong with you? Well, I didn't know what the speed limit was. I like limits. I like being told where I can't and where I can. I like when the Lord says to me, you better watch it, boy. I don't care if it applies to you or doesn't apply to you. God give you liberties He don't give me. Amen, amen, amen. And you can't put that on somebody else. But there are certain things that are in that Bible that are as clear as a bell. And if you choose that you don't want to do those things, then that's your choice. But I enjoy the liberty that I have. But it's not license. License is given to you for the purpose of doing wrong, to give you an opportunity to break something. Liberty is I'm free from it. I'm free. I don't have to sin anymore. I don't want to sin. It bothers me to sin. It upsets me. I feel like I've dipped the colors. It doesn't have to be anything major. It bothers me. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel dirty? Do you ever just feel like, man, what is wrong with me? And you hadn't even said nothing or anything. It's just what's going on up here. And then you just feel like a dog. You should know better than that. What's wrong with you? You ever had one of those? Isaiah, thank you, Miss Barbara. At least you and I have had them together. Isaiah chapter 10. Look in verse number 27. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of his anointing. You know what can happen to you? A fear prevents you from, uh, uh, from being able to handle the weight that's put on you. It prevents you from serving. It prevents you from being able to do what God would have you to do. It chokes out your dreams, your ideas of what it is. It weighs you down. Dave, uh, Paul says in Hebrews, he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. That thing comes, that thing gets burdensome to you. It's not burdensome. His yoke is easy and his burden is what? Why is it so heavy? Why is it so, why is it so hard? You say, what is that? That's this, that's this fear that I'm going to be weighed down by the Christian life. It's it's such a hard life. It's going to cost me so much to follow Him. You've got your eyes off eternity. I don't think it's hard to come to church. I don't think it's hard to read the Bible. What keeps you from reading the Bible? You're reading other stuff. Your mind's polluted with other things. 
Come on now, be honest. Don't just make me a mean old ogre of a preacher here. Your, your mind is consumed with other things. That's what keeps you from doing it. What keeps you from praying? Why is prayer so burdensome? You know, it's an odd thing. I guess a little bit there recently, a little more so. But, you know, we got Brother Richard's having a, a horrible, horrible time with his cancer now and seems to be spreading and that kind of thing. And you got her that's sick and we got some other friends of ours that are that are real sick. It seems to be going around. And my, uh, my grandson-in-law's uh, mother is uh, uh, real, real sick with cancer and that kind of deal. You know, it's a strange thing to me. I must be just, I must just be selfish beyond measure. I haven't found it burdensome to pray for them at all. I haven't found to go in there and ask the Lord to do something as far as us as a church. I don't, I haven't found that burdensome at all. I don't find it burdensome to pray for you. But you know what I do hear a lot of? It's just such a hard thing to pray. Man, are you kidding? What else? Where else are you going to go to tell somebody whatever it is you want to tell them and not have to worry about it going somewhere? He won't put it on Facebook. Don't worry. He ain't going to tell anybody. Why is it such a burden? Unless your mind is somewhere else. Too much YouTube and too much man's ways of resolving things. It takes a while. I do, what do you do? Sometimes I don't close my eyes when I pray because I'm walking and praying. I'm not, that's just how I pray. I don't always assume a position and get on my knees and get my hands in the right place and all that. I mean, I pray a lot of times when I'm in the car. Most people think I'm talking on my car phone. I don't care. I pray out loud, but not, not, not like in public if I'm having a private prayer, but I pray out loud. You say, what? Well, it helps to keep me focused. My mind wanders. And it might not wonder where you was wondered. Mine might be wondering about some kind of an outline or what I'm going to do when I get to so-and-so. If I'm talking to him, I don't think he appreciates interruptions. I really don't. I think he takes offense to it. Hey, you're talking to me. It's like, it's like you just keep interrupting the conversation and I'm the one doing the interrupting. If what you have to bring to me is so important, how come you're so easily distracted? You ever sit down and talk to somebody? Boys, you need to watch, listen to what I'm telling you. It's Mother's Day. You ain't going to have many more kids if you keep doing what I'm about to tell you. You ever been, you ever been sitting down there trying to talk to somebody and they're going... Yep. Are you listening? Oh, I, yeah, I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. I know how the brain works. You are not able to be hearing while you are doing that. That's like you being over .08 when you're driving a car. You, you think you can text and drive. You're not made that way. I, don't worry, I'm not going to give you a safety lesson. You can go on the When you get your ticket, you can go online and take that to save the points on your driver's license, on your insurance. You ever have somebody when you're talking to be doing that? Come on, boys, look up here. It's time to repent. <laughs> Some of you men are like, well, now it's gotten to be that way with women. You're having to come to Jesus with your wife? Now, she's been getting on to you because you've been doing it, but now it's different because beauty parlor appointment at, Manny Petty at, got to meet so-and-so for lunch. Amen? Now, let's apply it this way. What about in your prayer life? You go to your prayer life with your phone in your pocket? I used to. I'm talking about times specifically. You say, well, invariably, invariably, that thing will go off and it'll be something that somebody's world's coming to, and i got to do It's like, okay, you know what I don't do? I don't go, hey, i got to ignore that. It's like, that's more... They must need me more than I need Jesus. There it is. You ever have that happen? I think he takes offense to it. I think one of the reasons we don't get more answers to prayer is because he keeps getting interrupted while we're talking. Can you imagine talking to Jesus? Excuse me just a second. No, go ahead. I can I can I can multitask. I can. You know the problem with multitaskers? 
is they're never really good at any one thing. They can do a lot of things, but they're never really good at any one thing. Are you in the book of Isaiah? No, oh, oh, we already did that. Come to Mark chapter number 2. It can weigh you down. Mark chapter 2. She went out, so the little ones will be coming in here in just a little bit. Now, you guys got to ooh and awe when the little ones come in here, okay? Because it's a big deal to them, so they'll be coming from right over here. All right, Mark chapter 2. Look, if you will, please, in verse number oh, 22. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into what? You know what happens is your, perspe your perception of yourself has to change. Now, I want to help you with something here. I realize we're all wicked as the devil and we all have different forms of testimony and some got saved young and some got saved old and some got saved in jail and some got saved out of a woman and so forth. But you know what you can do if you're not careful? If you're not careful, that old man will come up and he'll rule your life. That Bible said, put off the old man and the deeds thereof and put on the new man. I don't serve the old man anymore. You know what I have to learn to do? Him and his corrupt, stinking way of thinking has got to go. But it takes effort to take him off. If I were right now, unless somebody were to help me to take my jacket off, I'd require effort to take my jacket off. And then if somebody handed me a new suit coat, it'd take effort to put it back on. It takes effort, ladies and gentlemen, to do what I'm telling you. It doesn't happen automatically. Salvation's instantaneous. That's your soul. The new man he's talking about there, ladies and gentlemen, is not putting on a soul. Your soul's saved. He's talking about taking off that old man and the lust thereof and getting rid of him. You say, what? Paul said, I die daily. Why? Much of me alive. There's still too much of me around. There's still too much of my self-preserving self around. You know what I have to learn to do? I have to learn to put it off. How often do you put it off, preacher? Well, for me, I have to put it off sometimes more than once in a day. I mean, sometimes I think I'm doing pretty good. And then I wake up out of the dream <laughs> And then I realize it starts right off the bat. I have a bad problem with worry, just being honest with you. The Bible says to be careful for nothing, right? Well, I'm careful about maybe too many things. Uh, that's an attribute of the old man. You see what it's connected with. I believe worry is connected with pride. So you're telling me you've got a problem with pride? Well, apparently. You say what? i uh, thinking I can control things only God can control. I mean, what man, the Bible says, can add an inch to a, a cubit to his statue or a, a part of a cubit to his statue by worrying about it? You can't change it. That's the hardest thing in the world to me is to hand that to the Lord. Don't we feel like it's kind of, <laughs> don't we feel like it's better in our hands? Is there any other control freaks in here? A preacher, you're just a control freak. <laughs> it, one or two? Well, okay, at least a half a dozen of us, anyhow. N nuts for Jesus. Uh, I struggle with that. So what do you worry about? I'm going to make you feel good. I worry about you. Is it okay to worry now? I worry about being whatever I need to be for whatever it is we're fixing to go through. And I don't even know what it is. I worry about my grandkids. I got great grandkids now. I worry about them. You say, what can, what can you do for them? <laughs> Nothing. But if I could, <laughs> I could fix so many things. You that way? You know what that Bible tells me? That Bible says I've been set free from that burden, from that weight, that thing that's on me. Look, if you will, please, here in Mark. I have to learn to view things from a different perspective. Mark chapter 2, when he says, old man and new man, I have to learn to change my perspective of things. You see the new wine bottle there? You say, what? You put new wine in there, when that stuff begins to ferment, they tell me it binds, it's got yeast or whatever in there. It begins to ferment. When it begins to ferment, it begins to smell. It gives off gases. And if it's in an old bottle, you know what will happen? It'll bust because it's fermenting. 
And one of the most difficult things in the world to do is, is to get up with Moses up on Pisgah and view things from God's perspective. We tend to view things this way, in an inverted triangle. Everything's about us. Everything's about us. Everything's about us. That's kind of a, a, an inability to be able to get up very high. These boys that hunt a lot, most of them hunt out of a tree stand. They get up there where they can look down on what's going on. Give me three shakes of a lamb's tail and I'll be with you. Uh, they, they, look stand, they look down so they can see things moving that are down above them. You go up on top of the Empire State Building or any place and you see things from a different perspective. What I'm talking to you about here is, is the new man has to consider what does God think about what he sees down here right now, not just what do I see. You say, what is that? This down here is the fear of man. This up here is the fear of God. All right. Father, bless your word and uh, bless these little ones as they come in here for the stuff they made. And uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'll finish this up here this evening.